Hello, hello, hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you are joining us from around the world. It's great to have you all signing in to take part in today's BioGal webinar, uh, Canine Parvovirus Infection Management, presented by Professor Nicola DeCaro. While we have you all logging on and settling in, I would like to let all of our Spanish, Portuguese, Italian and Turkish speakers know that we have live translation available. Uh, if you see on the bottom of your, of, your, of your Zoom menu, there should be an option for interpretation. If you click on that, you'll see there are options for Spanish, Portuguese, Italian and Turkish, and that will be translated live throughout the presentation today. Gracias, obrigada, gracias en tesha kula. Uh, while uh, we're waiting for everyone to log on, um, I would like to let you all know that we will be having a short question and answer session, session at the end of today's webinar, where we will present some of your questions asked, asked during the presentation to Dr. DeCaro. Could we ask, please, that you put all questions into the Q&A box? You should see an option in your Zoom menu called Q&A. If you could please put your questions into that section and not in the chat, that will ensure that they are recorded and that we can uh, make a record of them. As I said, we will present some of them at the end of the webinar. Don't worry if the question that you asked is not asked at the end of today. All questions will be recorded and pre presented to Dr. DeCaro, who will answer all of the questions asked today. And those will be sent to you, all questions and answers, along with the recording of today's webinar at a later date. So don't worry if your question is not answered live today, you will get an answer for it once uh, Dr. DeCaro has had a chance to go through all of the questions and answer all of them. But please ensure to put your questions into the Q&A box. My name is Jessica Case. I am the manager of Complete Veterinary Care. We are the UK distributors for Biogirl. And uh, Biogirl are the uh, lab that are putting on this fantastic presentation today. For those who don't know, Biogirl manufacture veterinary diagnostic tools. They make a range of small animal infectious disease detection products, including a lateral flow test kit and an ELISA test kit for parvovirus, which we will be learning about today. All of Biogirl's kits are designed to be used from the comfort of your own practice or lab very, very easily. They distribute to more than 50 countries around the world and provide plenty of support and educational tools with the latest veterinary updates. And Biogal are very happy to be putting on this webinar today presented by Dr. Professor, uh, sorry, Professor Nicola DeCaro. Uh, he's presenting this webinar about canine parvovirus infection management and the importance of accurate diagnosis. He will review the virus outcomes, clinical signs, disease stages, diagnosis, treatment recommendations, vaccination role and prevention measures, and much more. Before I introduce Dr. Uh, Nick, Professor Nicola DeCaro, um, just one more reminder to please put your questions in the Q&A box. And for all Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, and Turkish speakers, we have live translation available that you can access using the interpretation button on your Zoom menu. Okay, Professor, Do uh, Professor Nicola DeCaro obtained his PhD degree at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. He is now a professor of infectious diseases of animals at the University of Bari in Italy, where he is also director of the Department of Veterinary Medicine. Professor DeCaro is the vice president of the European College of Veterinary Microbiology and associate editor of the Journal of Virological Methods and editor in chief of Acta Tropica. He is a member of the editorial boards of several internal journals and the author or co-author of 280 articles in peer-reviewed international journals. It's great to have Dr. Uh, Professor DeCaro here uh, presenting for us this afternoon, and I'd like to hand over to him now. Thank you, Professor DeCaro. So thank you very much, Jessica, for this uh, very nice, wonderful introduction. 
and thanks to Biogal for inviting me to have uh, this webinar about uh, canine parvovirus infection. I will present some, uh, also some studies that are, that is, uh, is being done here in Bari. I work uh, at in Bari University, and uh, I worked for in the canine parvovirus field uh, for at least twenty five years. So I will also present the results of uh, our study here in Bari. Just the time to share my screen. If uh, all is okay, I can start uh, from the origin of the virus. I mean, which is the origin and evolution of this canine virus? As you may know, uh, canine parvovirus is uh, strictly related to a feline virus, the feline parvovirus, uh, and together they belong to the family parvoviride, and uh, they are now included in the new genus protoparvovirus and the new species uh, carnivore protoparvovirus one together with uh, other uh, parvovirus or carnivores. And they share about 98% uh, of uh, nucleotide identity. So are, they are very strictly related under epigenetic and uh, antigenic point of view. And there are very small rounded viruses, about 20 nanometers in diameter, and with, uh, without any envelope, so highly resistant in the environment, up to six months or more in the environment. And they also possess a single strand DNA, very small DNA molecule, about uh, 5,000 uh, nucleotides. And uh, this small uh, DNA contains only two genes, an S, a VP, uh, each encoding for two uh, proteins through, through an alternative splicing of the same messenger RNA. And um, there are so four proteins. The most important protein is the VP2, which uh, which uh, represents uh, uh, the two thirds of the viral capsid, interacts with the uh, cell receptors, and also stimulates the, the immune system of the host. So it is responsible for eliciting uh, neutralizing antibodies. And the canine parvovirus uh, is uh, a virus uh, under uh, um, continuous evolution. Uh, it possesses uh, uh, evolution rates uh, similar to those of RNA viruses. Uh, and this could be due to the high intrinsic variability of the single strand molecule uh, of the DNA, as well as to the positive selection pressure of the host uh, immune system. In contrast, feline parvovirus uh, is uh, not uh, so fast evolving, but uh, he's uh, a genetically stable virus. And uh, this virus, canine parvovirus, emerged in late 70s of the last century when uh, severe epidemics, we can say a panzootic, involved all the canine population in the world. Of course, they, the disease was first described in USA, but uh, Soon after, it was reported on, on, uh, also in other countries uh, and continents. Uh, and about the origin of this virus, uh, we, the scientific community, the international scientific community, agrees that uh, the canine virus uh, uh, is uh, a descendant of uh, feline parvovirus, uh, and uh, it was transmitted to dogs uh, directly or after a previous adaptation in an unknown uh, wild carnivore species. During the passage from feline parvovirus to canine parvovirus step two, uh, the virus uh, uh, underwent to some uh, mutations, uh, five, six mutations in the VP2 protein that uh, uh, lead, led to the um, acquisition of uh, the new host range the ability of the uh, VP2 to bind to the canine receptor, which is the transferring receptor. And uh, uh, the virus was named as a CPV type 2 only to distinguish it uh, 
from uh, an existing virus, a previous recognized virus, canine parvovirus type 1, which is presently known as uh, canine minute virus uh, and belongs to uh, a different genus, Boca virus. So it's uh, an unrelated virus. So uh, commonly speaking, we speak now about uh, uh, canine parvovirus and non-canine parvovirus type 2. Uh, with canine parvovirus type 2, we refer to the original type 2. This original type 2, uh, soon after its emergence, uh, evolved, uh, giving origin to uh, two different antigenic variants, CPV type 2A and type 2B, in a, a very short time. And um, this variant differed from the original type 2 in uh, uh, five uh, positions in, uh, in the VP2 protein. Five amino acid, while there is uh, now only one amino acid discriminating canine parvovirus type 2A from 2B. And this residue is, residue is located at position four to six of uh, the VP2 protein. When you can see uh, asparagine in CP uh, type 2A and aspartic acid in type 2B. And uh, in the most more recent years, uh, we in Bari detected for the first time a third variant, CPV type 2C, which present the change from aspartic acid to glutamic acid in the same position. So now we have three different variants widespread in all the world, while the original type 2 is no longer circulating. It is just present in some commercial available vaccine, but not in the field because the variant uh, presented uh, an evolution advantage over the original type 2, so that they were able to compete and replace the original type 2. And these variants also uh, present some biological properties that are different for uh, CPV type 2. They are more aggressive, and in addition, uh, they have an expanded host range. Uh, they are also able to infect cats, uh, uh, causing a disease in cats which is not uh, uh, dissimilar from uh, feline paleucopenia, uh, which is all caused by feline paleucopenia virus. So cats uh, may be infected by both feline paleucopenia virus, but also the antigenic variants of canine parvovirus. Uh, and we detected several uh, cases uh, of cats infected with the, with the canine variants. Uh, and which is the, the epidemiological situation? This uh, is a paper that was published about uh, 15 years ago. And uh, we conducted an epidemiological investigation in Europe with the help of uh, different research groups. And uh, we detected uh, a prevalence of uh, uh, type 2A and type 2C in Italy, of type 2B and C in Germany, type 2B and C also in Portugal, Why? while in the UK, we just detected one case of canine parvovirus type 2C. That means that uh, this variant is not circulating in the UK. And um, if, you, if we look at the international situation, we have that CPV type 2C uh, is, uh, is expanded his uh, geographic range in the last uh, years so that now, in contrast with the what reported in the, this table. Uh, now the virus is also spreading in Asia and even in Australia. So, but which are the clinical signs that are typical of uh, canine parvovirus infection? Uh, usually the virus uh, entered the, the canine host through the um, oronasal route. Uh, and the viral particles are able to replicate in the um, in, in nasal mucosa and associated lymphoid tissues. Then uh, it uh, causes uh, uh, viremia uh, through which it is able to spread to other uh, lymphoid tissues and also to the intestine. And the intestine, the primary site of replication of the virus is represented by the intestinal crypt that are the, um, the location of the intestine where uh, uh, the epithelial cells uh, uh, of the villi are, produ villi are produced. So that uh, the necrosis of the crypta uh, causes uh, usually an hemorrhagic diarrhea. However, hemorrhagic diarrhea is not always observed. Uh, sometimes we can detect non-hemorrhagic diarrhea in dogs, in pups with canine, uh, 
parvovirus infection, and hemorrhagic diarrhea in pups infected with other virus. For example, the less severe uh, coronavirus, canine coronavirus, sometimes it, uh, it, it is associated to hemorrhagic diarrhea. Another uh, clinical science constantly present is vomiting, several episodes for, per, per day, and uh, diarrhea and vomiting lead rapidly to dehydration and sometimes the death of the pup. Uh, fever in, is in constant, and what you commonly observe is leukopenia. However, leukopenia is not a constant finding. You should uh, always look at the differential counts of the different uh, leukocyte subpopulation, because for example, if you look at this pup, this pup was infected with the canine parvovirus type 2C. The, the report is in Italian, but uh, you can also see the WBC cells uh, in this case are uh, lower with respect to the normal range. And you can also detect lower uh, uh, numbers of uh, neutroph neutrophils and lymphocytes. But uh, if you look to another cases, this uh, clinical case, you can see that uh, uh, total leukocytes are increased, uh, almost 21,000, and uh, neutrophils are uh, increased, but the lymphocytes are decreased. So the message is uh, look at the differential counts, not only to the total counts, because uh, during canine parvovirus infection, lymphocytes are always affected by, but uh, neutrophils cannot be affected. They can be conserved or even increased. And uh, what about the shedding of the virus? This is very important for the diagnosis of the infection. In this paper, we uh, reported the fecal shedding of the virus. Uh, this was a type 2C variant, but it's the same with type 2A and type 2B. There is no important differences uh, in the biological uh, uh, feature uh, with the three different variants. And uh, you can see that by using a molecular assay, in this case, uh, uh, we use real-time PCR or quantitative PCR. You can see that uh, the shedding of the virus through the feces is very long-lasting. It can last up to 40, 50 days. And the viremia is more long, longer lasting, up to 60 days, but we didn't, pub we didn't publish any, any uh, manuscript uh, with, with regards to viremia. But uh, if you look at the, the curve of the, the shedding, you can see that uh, the maximum shedding is uh, reached uh, in the first uh, week, in the first seven, uh, 10 weeks. Uh, 10 days, sorry. So that uh, in the following days, there is a decrease in the viral tatter. So the pup uh, can uh, infect other dogs only in the first 15, 20 days. But uh, this virus, which uh, is shed uh, in the late stage of infection is not infectious for different reasons, the low titer and maybe also the presence of gut antibodies that sequestered the viral particles. And this is important for the diagnosis. In fact, for the diagnosis, you in your um, uh, in the practice uh, can use uh, the in-house assays, the clinical assays uh, that are uh, an adaptation of the ELISA test to the field, to the practice. Uh, so you can find uh, immunochromatographic tests or lateral flow assays or dot ELISA assays. Uh, they all use a monoclonal antibodies that is able to uh, detect, to bind to the viral particles, uh, to the viral antigens, uh, which is shed in the feces. In the lab, for several years, we have used hemagglutination that take us, uh, takes advantage of the ability of uh, parvovirus or carnivore parvoviruses to uh, bind to the red blood cells of some species. For example, we use swine erythrocytes, but you can other labs, they use uh, feline erythrocytes. And we demonstrated that uh, this uh, uh, test, both uh, in clinic uh, test and the hemagglutination assay, are able, are uh, very efficient in the first stage of infection, but not in the late stage of infection. Because in the late stage of infection, you can observe lower viral titers. Remember just uh, 
remember the graph we have uh, seen before, but also the viral particles uh, are sequestrated in the late stage of infection by uh, the antibodies that uh, can reach the, the intestine. So that uh, if uh, these viral particles are sequestrated by the, um, the antibodies, they are not able to react with uh, the monoclonal anti antibody of the test, and they are not able also to bind to um, erythrocytes. And uh, for uh, a short period, there was a debate among scientists about the ability of these in clinical assays to uh, detect uh, the new variant uh, CPV type 2C. But uh, we demonstrated with two different tests that uh, the efficiency of uh, the test to detect the three variants is more or less the same. There was no uh, different efficiency according to the different variants. And this was repeated with another test. So now we know that these assays are very useful to detect all three variants of canine parvovirus, but a negative result should be taken uh, in uh, account for subsequent tests, which can be um, molecular biology assay, as we will uh, show later. And uh, what we, we observe is that uh, even after vaccination, we can have uh, a long-term viremia and fecal shedding, and uh, what about the ability of the clinic assay to detect the vaccine virus? Uh, can I parvovirus vaccines are prepared with uh, um, uh, modified live viruses so that uh, when we administer the, the vaccine to the pup, if uh, the pup, of course, uh, doesn't have uh, material derived antibodies, uh, uh, the virus is able, the vaccine virus is able to replicate in the pup and to be shed to cause viremia and to be shed uh, with the feces. And in this case, you can see that we had two groups of pups, one uh, uh, vaccinated with uh, a type 2B vaccine and one vaccinated with the type 2 vaccine, the original type. And in both cases, we had uh, a long-term viremia and a long-term uh, uh, fecal shedding of the virus, of course, we observed lower titers, and also we had a reduction in the shedding time in the period of the shedding because the virus was the vaccine virus was shed just up to three weeks. This is important to know. But the most important thing in this case is that this fecal sample tested positive by using real-time PCR. But when we used uh, an in-clinic assay, no fecal sample test is possible by this assay. And the explanation is not that uh, the uh, antigen uh, testing is not able to detect the vaccine virus. Because if when we use the, the, the vaccine, um, the vaccine suspension, the test are not that positive. But the explanation is that um, the titers uh, shed in the feces uh, are lower so that uh, uh, they are under the detection limit of the antigen uh, testing assays. And uh, to overcome some limitation of the rapid uh, assays, uh, you can also ask for uh, uh, a molecular biology assay that are PCR or real-time PCR assays. For example, we uh, developed for the first time uh, more almost 20 years ago, the first real-time PCR assays for detection of canine parvovirus, but also canine uh, feline, sorry, uh, parvovirus. And um, which is the best sample to use for CPV detection? In this uh, uh, paper, we demonstrated that canine parvovirus, uh, irrespective of the variant, we used uh, 12 pups, three infected with type 2A, three with type 2B, three with type 2C. So the, the virus was present in all tissues, especially in uh, um, lymphoid tissue. For example, you can see very high titers in tonsils, uh, in uh, lymph nodes, uh, and uh, less virus was present in the feces. And we, this was also confirmed by these more recent papers. In this paper, the authors investigated the 
three different sampling sites for canine parvovirus uh, diagnosis and detection in 60, in 60 pups. And they were able to detect by real time PCR the virus in 95% of the blood, 98 of pharyngeal swabs, and 88 uh, of fecal swabs, respectively. So it seems that uh, feces maybe are not the best samples, uh, even if uh, it's the most, uh, the easiest samples to, to take from uh, the, the infected pups. But when uh, they look at the viral tatters, the way they were uh, almost similar in all three different sampling sites. And as an alternative uh, to the use of uh, molecular biology or also in clinical antigen detection assays, uh, you can also take advantage of the detection of IgM that are the first antibodies produced during active infection. So they are not detected when uh, the, the pup is recovering for, from canine parvovirus infection. And uh, in the same paper I showed you before, you can see that uh, 92 of the, of the 60 infected pups uh, displayed IgM antibodies uh, in the acute phase of infection with the very high viral, uh, antibody titers. But uh, the unique problem of this uh, test is uh, that it, it is not able to discriminate uh, the IgM, IgM antibodies produced after, as a consequence of the infection from those produced as a consequence of the vaccination. So you should be very careful in interpreting the results uh, just in the uh, first days after vaccination. So for diagnosis of canine parvovirus infection, you have different methods and uh, you could uh, select a different uh, tool according to the stage of infection. So you can choose between uh, antigen detection kit, PCR assays or real-time PCR assay, and also serology IgM. In the late stage of infection, you can only uh, you can also detect IgG, but of course you cannot discriminate between these antibodies uh, produced after uh, a recent infection from those produced after vaccination of uh, an old infection. And um, what about uh, canine parvovirus vaccination? For uh, canine parvovirus vaccination, usually we use a can, uh, vaccine prepared with the, the old uh, type uh, virus, as well as with uh, one of its variant. The most uh, used vaccine are prepared with uh, CPV type 2B, but in some parts of the world, so there are available also vaccine prepared with CPV type 2A and in Mexico, if I remember correctly. And uh, uh, recently, uh, there, was, there has been a, a new vaccine, recombinant vaccine that was licensed expressing the VP2 of uh, canine parvovirus type 2C. But despite the systematic vaccination of uh, uh, all pups, especially in developed countries, uh, uh, we are far from the eradication of the disease. And which, which are the factors uh, preventing uh, uh, close eradication of uh, canine parvovirus infection? You can see in this review that uh, we, I wrote with my mentor, Professor Bonavoglia, and also Dr. Bars, who is another international recognized scientist working on uh, viruses on dogs and cats. You can see that uh, there are different factors uh, preventing an, uh, an effective vaccination of the pups. And uh, the uh, CPV immunization failures are mainly related to the maternal immunity, but there are other causes that uh, could uh, prevent the seroconversion of vaccinated dogs. For example, the presence of uh, non-responders that are uh, um, pups uh, or dogs uh, genetically predisposed to not, uh, not to respond to vaccination. And in the case of canine parvovirus infection, these account for uh, one dog uh, uh, out of uh, um, 1,000 vaccinated animals. But there is also uh, so there are also some issues related to the CPV variants because we demonstrated that uh, vaccine prepared with the, the original type two are still effective against the variants, but. Uh, 
the virus neutralizing antibodies are uh, lower with respect to vaccine prepared, for example, with CPV type 2B. But the main problem related to the CPV immunization failures is represented by maternal derived antibodies. MDA are very important in the PAPs. You know that uh, they are the first antibodies, uh, uh, the first protection, sorry, for the PAPs, and they are mainly transferred through the colostrum in the first 24 hours, mainly, of life of the PAPs. And uh, these antibodies are very important to protect uh, the PAPs from CPV infection in the early stage in the, of uh, their life. But there is a correlation between uh, the titles of MDA and the protection against CPV infection. We know that uh, um, hemagglutination inhibiting titers less than 1 to 10 to 20 are not able to prevent uh, infection and uh, disease uh, of the PAPs. While we need uh, uh, MDA titers uh, uh, over 1 to 80 to have full protection. And uh, PAPs with uh, intermediate uh, um, uh, MDA titers uh, are susceptible to a symptomatic form of infection, but sometimes also to severe form of infection. And uh, we also know that there is a correlation between the MDA titers and the CPV vaccination. I mean that uh, uh, you know that uh, uh, vaccination uh, results in active immunization of PAPs only if uh, MDA titers are lower than 1 to 20. If uh, these titers are higher than 1 to 20, we can have interference by uh, MDA against seroconversion, against vaccination, because the uh, circulating antibodies of maternal origin are able to sequestrate uh, the viral particles contained in the vaccine preventing an active immunization of the PAPs. But uh, I told you that uh, we need uh, a titer of uh, more than 1 to 80 to, to have full protection against the disease. So uh, we also know that uh, uh, MDA levels uh, decline over the time. And uh, there is also an half time of MDA which range from uh, eight to 10 days, according also to the breed, uh, to the size of uh, the pups. So we expect that uh, during the early life of the pups, uh, there will be a period which is known as uh, immunologic gap or window of susceptibility, during which the pup is exposed and susceptible to the infection with the field virus, but uh, is unable to seroconvert if vaccinated. And this period usually can last from two to five weeks of age. And the problem is that uh, we, cannot, we can't predict when this immunologic gap occurs. So we usually uh, vaccinate pups in a blind manner. I mean that uh, we don't know when uh, this immunologic gap occur. In this pup uh, who had uh, after uh, uh, its birth uh, a title of 1 to 640, the immunologic gap occurred during from the five to the eight weeks. But uh, if this pup uh, had uh, a higher antibody titers after birth, of course, uh, you should move this gap uh, forward and this gap can also occur during the nine to the uh, to the twelve weeks. We, now we have pups with interfering MDA at the thirteenth at the fourteen weeks, which is a problem for vaccination, and which it will explain you the protocol that are recommended by all the international uh, uh, guidelines. And of course. The duration of the MDA interference depends on uh, the breeds of uh, the dogs. We know that uh, smaller uh, breed dogs, pups, uh, have uh, a longer lasting persistence of MDA with respect to large breeds. And of course, uh, another factor that uh, influences the duration of MDA is the antibody titers of the dam. If the dam has been recently vaccination, it is likely that she will pass to the offspring high, very high 
MDA levels. And uh, this uh, interference will uh, last longer. But also there is uh, an intraliters uh, uh, variability of the levels of MDA because uh, it, the, the first pups, for example, that uh, are born are able to assume more colostrum than the other. And also the growth rate can influence uh, uh, the, uh, the persistence of MD interference. So in the same litter, you can have pups that become susceptible to the infection before than other pups. And uh, there are different strategies that uh, have been set up to overcome the MD interference. A uh, first approach could be to uh, titrate the uh, maternal derived antibodies uh, um, during uh, the first week of age. For example, we suggest to particular pup, to, to the owner or the breeder of particular pups to uh, collect the blood and the serum, of course, at uh, four weeks of age. Then they send us the, the, the serum and uh, by use of uh, magnetization inhibition, uh, we can uh, assess the MDLA levels at four weeks and also predict the best moment uh, um, when vaccinated, when to vaccinate the pup uh, according to the half light of about 10 days of MDA. But of course, this is uh, an approach that can't be used uh, uh, routinely. So uh, what you can do in the practice is to use high tartar vaccine. These are uh, licensed vaccines that contain very high vaccine virus titers. Uh, traditional vaccine usually contain 10 to the third, 10 to the fourth uh, tissue calcium infection doses per ml. High tartar vaccine, they contain three, four logs more uh, uh, virus uh, from 10 to the sixth to 10 to the seventh. And uh, they work in this way. If you administer a high titer vaccine uh, to a pup with an intermediate MDA levels, uh, MDA are not able to sequestrate all viral particles contained in the vaccine so that uh, the remaining particles are able to replicate and to, in the dog, in the pup, and to stimulate uh, the immune system of the pup, uh, obtaining, resulting in a good seroconversion. We also had some uh, uh, trials with the intranasal, but also more recently oral vaccination of pups with monovalent vaccines containing only CPV. But uh, you should know that this is uh, an off-label uh, use of vaccine because at the moment there is no vaccine registered for the intranasal uh, use uh, for to be administered uh, using the intranasal route. But uh, using the intranasal vaccination, we obtain a seroconversion in the presence of immediate arthritis of one to eight and, uh, or uh, even one to um, one to eighty, one to uh, one hundred and sixty. Uh, and uh, uh, this seroconversion was obtained since uh, MDA are mainly represented by IgG antibodies that are circulating in the bloodstream. While uh, the local administration of uh, a live vaccine, of course, uh, uh, results in uh, the replication of the vaccine or the vaccine virus uh, in the in nasal uh, at the nasal in the nasal mucosa, so that uh, this replication can stimulate uh, the seroconversion. And uh, more recently, uh, there are recombinant vaccines that have been uh, introduced to the market. The vaccines. Uh, are, uh, has been constructed uh, with molecular biology by using the backbone of uh, a classical uh, old type 2 strain with uh, the VP2 gene of uh, a canine particular type 2 C. And according to what reported by the producing company, this vaccine is able to uh, obtain seroconversion also in the presence of high MDA titers. And the, the currently recommended protocol, the protocol recommended by international organizations such as the World Small Animal uh, uh, Veterinary Association uh, are based on the administration of several doses during the primary course of vaccination during the first uh, 
year of life of the pups so that uh, uh, depending on the period when you start on the week uh, of age when you start the vaccination you should administer three four doses of vaccine at two four weeks intervals between the sixth and the 16th week of age you the recommendation is not to finish the primary course of vaccination before the 16 weeks of age, week of age, because there are paths that at 13, at 14 weeks of age, they have uh, uh, still interfering MDA. And after this uh, primary course of vaccination, you could booster at six uh, uh, or uh, 12 months of age or at six, uh, 12 months after the primary course of vaccination, and then revaccination is recommended every three years. There is no sense today to vaccinate dogs every year. A three-year uh, vaccination protocol of adult dogs is uh, enough for the scientific community. And also, you can also uh, assess the seroconversion using serological in clinic assays. These assays are available for core vaccine in dogs and cats. Core vaccines are vaccines that have to be administered to all dogs or cats, regardless the geographic area and the epidemiological situation, because they protect dogs and cats from severe disease that are widespread in all the world. And these vaccines for dogs include canine parvovirus, distemper, and uh, infectious hepatitis, and for cats, feline palucopenia, feline uh, calicivirus infection, and herpes virus infection, or feline infectious rhinotrochitis. These uh, serology and clinical assays are uh, uh, also based on uh, the adaptation of the ELISA assays. They are dot ELISA test, and uh, they can be um, carried out uh, in the lab or also in the um, in the veterinary clinics. So these are tests that uh, can be done in the practice uh, because you don't need any uh, ELISA reader, but uh, the, um, the reading is based on the visual inspection. And uh, in addition, there is a colorimetric compar comparison with the standards provided in the kit. So this is a semi-quantitative assay that uh, can also calculate uh, the level of uh, antibodies after vaccination. And of course, uh, theoretically, you should uh, have uh, an optimal situation when you have, for example, for feline parvovirus, but also for feline parvovirus, uh, an antibody status of uh, 1 to 80. But the scientific community now agrees that uh, the only presence of antibodies from active immunity of dogs, so not MDA, but uh, antibodies uh, that are produced by the vaccinated pups or pup or dog, uh, is uh, protective against canine parvovirus disease, regardless of the titer. That means that even if you have uh, um, titers, antibody titers less than uh, one to eighty in a vaccinated dog, this uh, uh, titer is still protective because you should also consider that. Uh, the active immunity also includes uh, the presence of memory cells and also the uh, cell-mediated immunity that is not routinely investigated. Uh, what is the use of these serological assays? These serological assays can be used to evaluate the serological conversion after primary vaccination course, but also can be used to evaluate the need for the 3R booster in some particular cases. For example, all dogs uh, that have been uh, uh, repeated vaccination during their life, or dogs that uh, have uh, produced, have uh, um, displayed allergic or anaphylactic reaction after vaccination, or dogs with no history of anamnesis, because we can vaccinate these dogs or uh, assess the, um, the levels of level of protection against CPV, but also canine distemper and. Uh, can an infectious hepatitis. And this is uh, just an algorithm published by the World Small Animal Veterinary Association, uh, how to monitor or to assess the seroconversion after the primary uh, vaccination course in the PAP. You can see that uh, the, this uh, vaccination course uh, 
and set uh, six weeks of age or more. And uh, after four weeks, you can uh, use uh, the in-clinic uh, assay. If uh, uh, the, the assay is test positive for Kerandis temper, adenovirus, and parvovirus, uh, you can uh, proceed with uh, a booster no more often than uh, three years. But if the test is negative, you have to repeat the vaccination, preferably using different product. And then after four weeks, repeat serology. If positive, no problem, booster every three years. But if negative, maybe the puppy is a non-responder and should be uh, treated with particular care for, for, for example, the contact with other pups. And uh, what about the treatment? Of course, uh, I forgot to tell you that uh, I'm uh, not a clinician. I'm a, a virologist. Um, uh, my all experience is in the lab, but uh, we did also some experiments with the vaccination and the treatment of uh, dogs with canine parvovirus infection. And uh, there, is, there is still some discussion about uh, uh, which is uh, the more effective treatment of, of uh, dogs with parvoviral enteritis, uh, especially in relation to the use of some particular molecules or product. Of course, you know that uh, the treatment of canine parvovirus infection is mainly supportive and symptomatic. So it is based on the administration of fluid, for example, lactate ring solution to restore the hydric and electrolytic balance. But also you can administer anti-emetic drugs, a gas protector for the gastroenteric sign of the disease. But also sometimes uh, uh, full blood or plasma transfusions are required uh, in order to restore the oncolytic uh, balance in terms of the proteins that are uh, lost uh, due, to, uh, due to the enteritis. And uh, in particular condition, you can also uh, use the enteral nutrition through nasopharynge or nasogastric tubes. But uh, most importantly, you should administer both broad spectrum antibiotics. And these uh, antibiotics, they do not work against the virus, of course but they can be useful because during uh, uh, canine parvovirus infection, there is uh, uh, an acute uh, immunosuppression due to the lysis of the necrosis of the lymphoid tissues and uh, the drop uh, of the WBC uh, counts, especially uh, of the lymphocyte counts, uh, so that uh, you can also have secondary infection by opportunistic pathogens, not only in the enteric tract, but also in the lungs. For we, we had several cases of dogs uh, or pups with respiratory infections due to bacterial uh, uh, infection consequent to the immunosuppression uh, due to the parvovirus infection. And um, another discussion is related to the use of uh, plasma immune plasma for the treatment of canine parvovirus infection. In recent years, all uh, are agree, all scientists are agree that uh, there is no evidence for uh, scientific evidence, at least for the use of immune plasma for the treatment of canine parvovirus infection. For example, in this paper, which was published about uh, uh, 10 years ago, you can see that uh, there is no statistically significant difference between uh, the uh, pups, uh, the groups of pups uh, with canine parvovirus infection treated with immune plasma or, or not, that represent the placebo group uh, in terms of weight loss, uh, time in hospitalization, cost of treatment. So we do not suggest use of uh, immune plasma. Um, the situation could be slightly different for uh, use of purified immunoglobulins. For example, in this uh, case, uh, they use the feline product, uh, which could be also effective against parvovirus infection. They demonstrated, these authors demonstrated that uh, pups treated with uh, immunoglobulins uh, had a better rate of recovery and also uh, they survived at greater rates with respect uh, of the other groups uh, not treated with uh, 
uh, these antibodies. But of course, you should also consider that this paper was published uh, on uh, um, uh, uh, journal, uh, which is not uh, outstanding in the scientific community. And another uh, molecule that uh, is sometimes administered against uh, canine paralysis infection is interferon omega. You know that uh, this uh, molecule was uh, developed against uh, uh, mainly retrovirus infection of uh, cats, but in this study, the author demonstrated that uh, this molecule could be also effective, uh, poor uh, effective, but effective against canine parvovirus infection in terms of reduction of clinical store, uh, score, sorry, and uh, improvement or survival of the treated pups, but uh, other uh, studies, they do not uh, confirm, confirm this preliminary, preliminary results. So I do not also suggest use of interferon omega in the treatment of canine paralysis infection. Uh, a couple of years ago, three years ago, we did uh, a study using uh, the uh, a recombinant canine granulocyte colon stimulating factor to increase uh, leukocyte count in dogs uh, naturally infected by canine parvovirus. And we demonstrated that uh, uh, CGCASF molecules are able to uh, increase, to cause an increase of the total leukocyte counts, but also of the lymphocytes, lymphocyte counts that are very important uh, against the infection. We also observed some improvement uh, of the clinical uh, situation with reduction of clinical sore in the uh, treated uh, pups with respect to the untreated, to, to the placebo group. And that's all for the moment. Just uh, I thank you for the attention. And this is a picture of my city, Bari, which is a very nice uh, city or in the Apulia region, uh, uh, located in the sea just in front of Greece of Albany. So thank you. And I'm ready to have to receive to respond to your questions. Thank you very much, Professor Decaro. Wow, your city looks beautiful. Um, that uh, discussion was was very interesting, very very helpful. Thank you so much. I uh, really enjoyed it, and I'm sure everyone else did as well. Um, it's been great to see lots of questions uh, coming in. Uh, I have a couple here that I will present to you now, and hopefully you can answer. Um, just a reminder for everyone that has submitted questions: if we don't answer your question now, don't worry. Uh, we will uh, present all the questions to Professor DeCaro, who will answer them, and then they will be sent along with the recording of the webinar at a later date. So Professor DeCaro, the first question that we had was actually from Dr. Diane Addy, who's a, a friend of Biogal, um, has done a couple of webinars for them herself. Uh, she said, uh, a wonderful lecture. Thank you, Professor DeCaro. And then her question was, is it possible that canine parvovirus emerged by accident from a feline vaccine contaminant? So thank, thanks to Diane for the question. I know Diane personally, we had uh, some uh, studies together uh, on, on another emerging uh, issue, which is the use of uh, uh, some drugs uh, against FIP. Okay. And uh, yes, uh, Diane, this is uh, another hypothesis that uh, was uh, uh, pushed in the first year. Now, the scientific community uh, tends to, to give to, uh, a lesser importance to this hypothesis. The hypothesis is that uh, the canine virus emerge as uh, host variant of feline parvovirus after uh, use of feline vaccines against this virus. Because uh, you know that uh, in the first uh, years, uh, after the emergence of uh, canine parvovirus, dogs were vaccinated with uh, feline parvovirus vaccine because they were the unique vaccine um, uh, available in the, in, uh, in the market. So they have uh, had uh, a poor efficacy, more than uh, 1,000 less uh, with respect to homologous vaccines prepared with uh, CPV. So an hypothesis is still uh, debated that uh, 
uh, vaccine uh, uh, against feline paleocopenia used in dogs can uh, uh, could uh, have uh, favored the, the transmission the adaptation of the feline virus to this species is an hypothesis but uh, in this uh, time uh, most scientists uh, uh, think that it was a natural passage of the virus from cats to dogs okay thank you um, our second question is, could a Parvo-ELISA test show a positive result after a recent vaccination? This is uh, some common in cats. There are some studies uh, accounting that uh, kittens after vaccination may uh, react positive, may, turn, may, may test that positive. Uh, using an in clinic assay, but uh, it's uh, only theoretical for dogs. I mean that uh, several studies have demonstrated that uh, these tests are not able uh, to react uh, with uh, uh, the virus shed, vaccine virus shed after vaccination. But uh, as I told in my presentation, uh, the, the reason is not that uh, the test is unable to recognize the vaccine virus. The vaccine virus and the field viruses are very related and it's quite impossible that a monoclonal antibody just reacts with that specific amino acid that is present in the vaccine virus and not in the field viruses. The reason, likely, of course, is that the vaccine virus is shed at lower titers with respect to the field virus. We uh, we know more than three or four logs less sh shedding between the vaccine and the field viruses. Okay, great. Thank you. So it's just uh, uh, an issue of quantity, not mm -hmm. quality. Okay, great. Thank you. The third question is, when should a bitch get a parvo shot before breeding? Ah, this is a... A nice question, but I have no uh, unambiguous response. I mean, I do not suggest to vaccinate uh, uh, them uh, before breeding, just before breeding or uh, uh, during pregnancy. There are also vaccines that uh, can be used during pregnancy because uh, you obtain uh, uh, that the, the, the beach produces a very high uh, antibody titers, thanks to the recent vaccination, but the pups will have uh, ob obviously very high MDA titers that will persist for several weeks. And this is the reason why in the last decades, we observe a longer persistence of MDA with respect to the past. The reason is that the dams now are uh, uh, vaccinated a, lo a lot of times with respect to the, the past. So they transfer to their offspring very high and persisting MDA levels. So I do not suggest to vaccinate the, uh, the beach uh, just before mating or during the pregnancy, of course. Of course, most of vaccines are not registered for administration during pregnancy, okay? Okay. Thank you very much. Well, we are out of time. Uh, so I just want to say thank you again, uh, Professor DeCaro. That was amazing. Very, very interesting. Very, very helpful. Thank you for your time and for your presentation. Thank you to everyone that attended. Um, it's been great to have all your questions and, and see you all taking part in the chat. Um, we hope that we will be able to see you soon at the next webinar, uh, which will be about tick-borne diseases with Dr. Michael Lappin on the 6th of July. You can register now on the Biogal website or your local distributors should be sending out links for you to register on that uh, coming up on the 6th of July. Uh, thank you very much to all of the translators and thank you to Biogal for putting on this webinar. Uh, it's been great to see everyone. Your certificates of attendance, along with the recording of the webinar and a full list of questions and answers will be sent in a, in a few days time. So you have that to look forward to. Uh, we hope to see you again soon and thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.